For those of you who don't know me, my name is Dan Dowd. I'm the VP of Medical Affairs here at Genomind. And tonight, the title of tonight's presentation will be the management of ADHD with a focus on pharmacogenetics. So uh, this topic is, um, we're presenting this due to popular demand. We get a lot of questions about the ADHD meds and we'll spend 45 minutes tonight going over some of the genes related to uh, some of your uh, first tier and second tier ADHD medications. And then we'll try to leave 15 minutes for Q&A. Um, but if you have questions throughout the presentation, feel free to use the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen. So with that said, let's introduce our presenters for tonight. First up, we have Dr. Seema Patel. Seema Patel is part of our medical science liaison team here at Genomine. She is a PharmD. Uh, she currently uh, handles the Northeast region of the country. So Dr. Patel received her PharmD degree from the University of the Sciences in Philadelphia. She completed two years of residency, PGY2 specialty residency in psychiatry, focused on performing psychiatric interviews, treatment assessment, evidence-based recommendations on multidisciplinary rounds, teaching lectures at VCU School of Pharmacy, and performing drug utilization review and order verification on psychiatric patient care services. Uh, she's board certified as a psychiatric pharmacist. Before she came to Genomine, she worked as a clinical psychiatric pharmacist at Harvard Vanguard Medical Associates Atrius Health in a collaborative drug therapy management clinic. And that was working with and treating uh, patients with psychiatric disorders. Through her clinical research experience, she's presented at ID Week and published on the utilization of intramuscular olanzapine and zeprazidone in the medically ill. Uh, we will send out these slides tomorrow, and if you're interested in clicking on the links of some of, of, some of Sina's pub publications, they will be embedded in these slides that we send out tomorrow. So the team, the medical science liaison team will tag team this presentation. So along with SEMA, we have Dr. Russell Amato, PhD. Uh, Dr. Amato is currently a uh, medical science li liaison down in Louisiana. So he covers the Southeast part of the country. Um, and Russell received his PhD from the Department of Pharmacology and Experimental Therapeutics at LSU Health Sciences Center. Uh, Dr. Amato has over 10 years experience conducting preclinical research and publishing extensively on novel therapeutics for the treatment of psychiatric disorders, including drug dependence, depression, and anxiety. So Dr. Amato has published on the implementation of pharmacogenetics in psychiatry and has been interviewed on the Well-Informed Patient Podcast and other media. So you can see the links here and uh, similar to SEMA. Uh, if you're interested, you can click on these links when you receive the slides tomorrow. So I went through that pretty quickly. Um, I hope I didn't shortchange e either of our speakers, but they're both very impressive speakers. So I will hand it off to them and let them take it from here. So Seema, I think you're gonna be starting first. So Dr. Patel, take it away. Thanks Dr. Dowd for those introductions. Um, so I'm gonna spend the first half of this talk just discussing some evaluation of ADHD and some of the treatment guidelines for treating ADHD. Then we're gonna discuss the role of pharmacodynamics and the role of pharmacokinetics and wrap up with a case vignette and a Q&A. And like Dr. Dowd mentioned, there is a chat function. So feel free to drop your questions um, throughout the presentation. We have our clinical team who will answer them. And then any live questions, Dr. Amato and myself will be able to answer those. So first, we're going to uh, talk a little bit about evaluating ADHD and uh, the current kind of the current state of ADHD today. And many of us understand ADHD as this persistent pattern of inattentive, uh, hyperactive, impulsive symptoms. And we know that can have an impact on functioning and quality of life. And because these patients or individuals have symptoms in two different settings, you can imagine that can really impact uh, an individual social, uh, occupational, and academic functioning. And over the years, we've really seen this increase in the ADHD diagnosis. This is actually a graph um, from the CDC that, that evaluates or looks at the percentage of children with a parent reported ADHD diagnosis. And you can see over the years, there's been a uh, upward trend or rise in ADHD diagnosis. This is coming from estimates of uh, survey data, um, national representative survey data. 
And interestingly enough, from 2003 to 2011, there was a 42% increase in ADHD diagnosis. The reason for this is probably multifactorial, right? There's been probably a, a lot of researchers allude to the rise in ADHD diagnosis to the fact that a lot of clinicians are better able to recognize ADHD. There's less stigma about an ADHD diagnosis among parents and schools. And then also we've seen an increase in ADHD diagnosis among minority communities. So there's also reduced stigma in minority communities about mental health care in general. And then some piece of this probably plays a role in that historically, uh, we tend to see ADHD in terms of hyperactivity, which we know are more observable and more well uh, predominant in boys and males. And with the new DSM and the APA recognizing the inattentive symptoms, we start to see girls being diagnosed more um, where these observable traits are more uh, prevalent in males. So there are a couple of different reasons why the, we are seeing this rise in ADHD. Um, but another piece of the equation here is understanding coexisting conditions, right? So what you're looking on the right here are patients with ADHD with some type of other coexisting condition. You can see here that of these children with ADHD, 64% had some type of other mental or behavioral disorder. This uh, goes from a conduct problem to an anxiety disorder or depressive disorder. And we all know this, right? But it's important to understand that when we're treating ADHD, we have to look at all these other coexisting conditions that, that can occur because it can impact our care and treatment for our patients. And, you know, I think we all understand with the COVID pandemic and what's been going on that a lot of these children's routines have been disturbed. Um, there was a survey, recent survey that showed caregivers, they noticed a lot more issues and disturbances in sleep and eating behaviors, eating more unhealthy foods, spending more time uh, playing video games. And all of these were correlated with increases in anxiety, depression, ADHD symptoms. And so we have to really look at all of these factors together when we're assessing and evaluating a patient um, suspected to have an ADHD. There are a lot of different factors that are involved when we're evaluating ADHD. These are just some among many. Of course, we need to look at the history of symptoms, age of onset. What type of subtype are we predominantly looking at? Inattentive, hyperactive, impulsive, or both? Comorbid conditions, so I alluded to this earlier, but is this a comorbid anxiety disorder or is this anxiety that looks like ADHD? So those are all things that we should be thinking about. A structured interview is crucial when evaluating ADHD because this is really where we get a lot of our information gathering. We do our val validated ADHD ass assessments and instruments for children. This could be the Connors scale or the Vanderbilt scale. Um, there are some for adults as well. Connors has an adult ADHD rating scale. And it, even though these are not diagnostic by any means, they can really help serve as a adjunct uh, for our clinical and psychosocial assessment. And then also patients functioning in academic work and social interactions is really important because understanding teachers' input, uh, what's been going on at home, parents' input, if it's adult ADHD, understanding from the family or from the spouse uh, what's been going on. So all of that information gathering is important when we're trying to um, formulate this diagnosis. And then medical history and family history are important. There's a genetic aspect to ADHD. So asking about moms and dads, um, you know, history of any type of psychiatric illness is important. And then physical and neurological examination can be helpful in terms of ruling out other causes of these symptoms. When after we've really confirmed this diagnosis of ADHD, we have to have a discussion about treatment plan. And the most recently updated guidelines come from the American Academy of Pediatrics. These were published in 2019. And their recommendations for children ages four to five is of course, first line behavioral management, behavioral classroom interventions if they're available. And if symptoms persist despite behavioral management or are really severe, they do uh, recommend as a second line off-label choice methylphenidate. Uh, if you know about medications and their approval and age, you know that Adderall or, is the only medication that is approved less than six years of age. And the authors do discuss this, but they 
refer to the fact that at that time there were less uh, stringent criteria in authorizing this approval. And when they reevaluated that data, they did not believe it was adequate enough to include it as an option for this preschool age group. So if you if there is a medication to be used in this group, it will be methylphenidate. Talking more about children, adolescents, six years and up, the guidelines refer to any FDA-approved medication as first line, but they do talk about strength of evidence for ADHD, right? Stimulants, adamoxetine, extended release guanfacine, and extended release clonidine in descending order. And then, of course, they want to combine this with parent training and behavioral management and any behavioral classroom interventions. And although, uh, you know, they don't really refer specifically to one type of medication as first line, they talk about the evidence. Typically in the U.S., stimulants are the most prescribed. When you look at a lot of treatment algorithms, typically people start uh, one type of stimulant. If that doesn't work, then they go to the other type of stimulant before moving on to a non-stimulant. So that's typically um, the practice and a lot of the algorithms will mirror that. But what you'll notice is that these guidelines don't really give us specific information about what type of patient would I use one medication for versus another. They allude to age, of course, but um, we're still having more questions um, even after reviewing those guidelines. So Cortez and colleagues, they actually uh, summarized and looked at all the treatments for ADHD in this network of meta-analysis and looked at the effects of efficacy. If you look at this top forest plot up here, it's um, split up by children, adolescents on the left and adults on the right. It's no surprise that all of these medications on the left favor the drug, right? Most of these are approved for ADHD, so we would expect that. But you know, even things like bupropion, modafinil, which are off-label, were also favored in children and adolescents. But in adults, interestingly enough, modafinil was the only one that was no better than placebo. On the bottom graph looks more particularly at tolerability. So in children and adolescents, we see amphetamines and guanfacine having more intolerable rates. And then for adults, amphetamines, adamoxetine, and uh, methylphenidate are more intolerable. And then in this network of meta-analysis, they did see increases in diastolic blood pressure uh, with amphetamines in children and adolescents, but not in adults. And when compiling the evidence for efficacy and safety in this network meta-analysis, the authors concluded that methylphenidate should be first line for children and adolescents and amphetamine should be first line for adults. There was a nice concise paper from Arnett and Stein uh, that I highly recommend reading after this network meta-analysis because they really talk about the pros and limitations to the network meta-analysis, right? It does give us some basic guidance in terms of age in regards to treatment, but we're still left wondering, you know, what is the chance of somebody responding to these medications? And what is the indication for multiple interventions since often patients are not adequately treated with one treatment? So in, they recognize here that in terms of the treatment algorithm development for this problem, we remain stuck at the very first branch. So this kind of segues nicely into the topic of pharmacogenomics. We recognize that in psychiatry, it is not a one size fits all situation like many other disease states, but even with ADHD, right? What's gonna work well for one child is not gonna work well for another. And pharmacogenetics and assessing a genetic profile, drug metabolism, pharmacodynamic genes, insight into response to medication, drug-drug interactions, all, right, all of these can really be really important in helping us to predict or estimate the chance of response to some of these medications or the probability of them having a side effect or an adverse effect, for example. In discussing pharmacogenetic testing, there's a lot of different golden rules that we talk about. These are three really important ones. One of the biggest ones is it, pharmacogenetic testing is probabilistic and not deterministic. You've probably heard us say this before, but it's not going to identify the perfect drug for any one patient. It just provides a probability of estimates of response or risk. And it just adds to a clinical presentation. So there are a lot of different tools that you clinicians probably use on an everyday basis in treating your patients. Guidelines, um, your training, a lot of different factors that you all have um, under your belt. And this is just an additional tool to help you make treatment decisions for your patient. We aren't relying solely on pharmacogenetic information, right? We have to understand treatment guidelines, patient characteristics, and use that together to formulate a treatment plan. And finally, 
uh, we do have some genes and evidence for markers that help us um, estimate drug response, but pharmacogenetics still does a better job at assessing drug tolerability risk. Uh, the field is rapidly growing, as you know, and new guidelines are being routinely published. In terms of treatment demographics for our testing, it might surprise you that nearly 55% of our testing is done in the 6 to 25 year old age range. And if you look at this distribution, you're probably thinking, okay, well, there are probably a lot of these patients who have ADHD. And that, while that's true, you also see anxiety and depression. So this goes back to that first slide that I was showing earlier, and that when we're treating these patients and using pharmacogenetic testing for ADHD, we also have access to information to some of these markers that could help guide treatment for anxiety or depression, for example, right? Because how we metabolize drugs not only impacts ADHD, but also some of these other coexisting conditions of ADHD. Now that we've done a kind of a brief overview and evaluation of ADHD and the typical starting point for treatment, uh, let's dive into the role of pharmacodynamics in ADHD treatment. The first gene that I'm going to talk about here is COMT. Uh, this is a gene and an enzyme that plays a role in the breakdown of dopamine in the prefrontal cortex. You can either be comp val val comp val met or MET-MET. If you happen to be somebody who's comp val val this is somebody who's got high activity comp, right? And because there's a lot of comp activity breaking dopamine down, you end up with lower levels in that prefrontal cortex. On the flip side, if you're comp met met, you have a low activity comp and therefore higher levels of dopamine floating around in that prefrontal cortex. Many of you might have been familiar or seen the U-curve, the dopamine U-curve hypothesis before. This is um, an example of a working memory task, basically. This is actually pretty high working um, load, working memory load, as uh, individuals had to recall a stimulus from three trials back. But the important part here is really that on the y-axis, we have this prefrontal cortex functioning, and the green um, coloring here is representing valval, the red is representing met-met. So to orient you here, the valval patients here in green at baseline, right, they have lower prefrontal cortex functioning, lower dopamine, but if they're given an amphetamine, this shifts them to a more optimal dopamine level. The patients who are met met here in red, even though they're near the optimal level, if you give them an amphetamine, this shifts them towards the downward part of the U-curve, and that can have consequences, either um, no effect or even adverse effects based on this hypothesis. And so what this tells us is that too little or too much dopamine can have consequences. It's really finding that optimal range that's important. And the literature uh, actually supports this. Um, so with the comp val val patients, it's no surprise that data shows an improved response to stimulants in patients who have low levels of dopamine. On the flip side, for met, -MET patients, we, we see a reduced response to stimulant medication. Where does this data come from? One of the meta one of the meta analyses that we commonly referred to is this one done by Meyer and colleagues back in 2018. And it looked at around seven studies of around 600 children and adolescents. If you look here on the far plot on the right, patients who were val val, they were about 40% more likely to respond to methylphenidate compared to met carriers. So again, confirming that um, kind of dopamine hypothesis where these low level individual, low level dopamine individuals seem to do better with dopamine enhancing agents. This is replicated in the study by Karatsuri and colleagues. But this is a really important illustration for a couple of different reasons, right? The left side of valve valve, no surprise, we see 87% response rate in valve valves. But what I really wanna kind of talk about here is this uh, diagram on the right, the MET-MET patients, because it brings up, again, a point I made earlier about pharmacogenetics and the probabilities. When we say that there's a reduced chance of having a response to medication based on a gene, we aren't saying a 0% chance, and this shows that, right? 58% of met med still had a response. But what this tells us is that if we are gonna prescribe a stimulant for a patient who's met met, which we certainly can, right? This is not a contraindication to starting a stimulant. We might go into it knowing that this is somebody who's gonna be more likely to have treatment failure. And maybe that will help us to move on to a different type of medication earlier rather than later. 
The uh, next gene, um, pharmacodynamic gene I'm going to talk about is ADR2A, the adrenergic alpha-2A receptor gene. This is involved in norepinephrine to improve attention and working memory. Um, the ADR2A variation can influence the ADR2A receptor sensitivity to norepinephrine and to methylphenidate for ADHD. And the studies that evaluated ADR2A and methylphenidate showed that patients who had the G allele had an improved response. If you look at this left graph over here, on the y-axis, we have reduction in inattentive scores from baseline. And on the x-axis, we have treatment duration. It is clear here that at both one month and three months, the patients who had the G allele, the, the people here in green, they had greater improvements in inattentive scores and compared to patients without the G allele. This was replicated in a meta-analysis of about 350 children and adolescents where they saw same thing. Um, patients who had the G allele here, they were about 69% more likely to respond to methylphenidate compared to patients who had the CC genotype. So, you know, pharmacodynamic genes can be really insightful and help us to give a better idea of the chance of response. It's kind of referring earlier to what Arnett and Stein were talking about, right? Our guidelines so far tell us what medications are effective. They don't really give us too much predictions for any individual patient on what medication might have a better chance of working. So this is a step further in that direction of providing a little bit more clarity. Um, but next up, I'm going to have Dr. Amato switch gears here a little bit and talk about the role of pharmacokinetics in ADHD treatment. Dr. Mato, take it away. Excellent, excellent. Thank you, Dr. Patel. Uh, that was great. So I'm going to take over now, right? Uh, we've talked a little bit about the pharmacodynamics and how they may affect response rate, but let's talk a little bit about how our pharmacokinetics may affect the way we metabolize our medications. So what you're looking at now is a graph, right? And you can see that each one of these lines is labeled, right? UM, RM, EM, which, they're calling NM now for normal metabolism. Uh, you see that there are various ways that a patient, right, depending upon their genotype, might process a medication. And, and again, this, this process of elimination usually involves adding some kind of hydrophilic, right, uh, adaptation or chemical, right, uh, manipulation to the chemical itself to actually make it easier to excrete. And well, unfortunately, some people have variations within their cytochrome P450s that slow this process down, right? Some of these gene variations are slower. Some work almost not at all, right? We call these poor metabolizers. They generally tend to have very, very high levels of the drugs that they take, right? And for drugs that treat ADHD, these are medications like amphetamine, atomoxetine, right? Um, for... Uh, CYP3A4 substrates, these can be drugs like guanfacine or modafinil or modafinil. But we also have problems with patients who break their medications down too quickly as well. You'll see these ultra rapid metabolizers, they tend to have very, very low levels of drug. And again, same drug, same pathways, just faster metabolism this time. And you'll notice that it kind of falls outside of the normal therapeutic window here, which is kind of illustrated by these two black bars that are going horizontally, right? It makes it very difficult to achieve that steady state concentration. And as you might expect, slow metabolizers like PMs and IMs generally tend to have higher serum levels. And RMs and UMs, those are rapid metabolizers and ultra rapid metabolizers, they tend to have less of that drug exposure and they tend to fail their medications more frequently due to efficacy issues, right? So it's more side effects uh, for the most part with poor metabolizers and it's more inefficacy when you've got that rapid metabolism. Now, moving on, um, what do we have to say about how cytochrome P450s interact with these ADHD medications? Well, what you guys should know is it's not just Genomine making these recommendations you might end up seeing these little symbols on one of our printouts, our, our pro-PGX reports. And those symbols are letting you know it's not just Genomine saying you may need to be careful with the dosing of your medication. It's the FDA or an academic institution like CPIC, the Clinical Pharmacogenetics Implementation Consortium. They write published guidelines 
specifically for patients with mutations in their cytochrome P450s. In this case, uh, this is a screenshot of farm GKB. Uh, it's basically giving you a quick snapshot view of the, um, of the guideline for atomoxetine. And you guys will notice that there is this poor metabolizer status associated with a lower final dose requirement. It's essentially telling you, right, you may not need to go to the higher end of that atomoxetine dose range because these patients generally, when they do respond to this medication, it's generally at lower doses. You'll even see that they might recommend taking actual blood levels in a poor metabolizer just to make sure those concentrations aren't too high. Right? And if you guys are ever wondering, well, I've always kind of wondered what pharmacogenetics, what genes interact with the drugs that I'm giving, this is a great site to do so, right? You guys click on this Farm GKB link when you get this uh, presentation. It's a really cool tool. You could type in any drug you're thinking of, and it'll show you which genes have some type of association with that particular drug. So it's a very cool tool. It's just an NIH funded database. It'll give you a lot of information. Uh, so if you've ever been interested in what those genetic polymorphisms might do to a drug, that's a really great place to check it out. You can also though find this type of information on the FDA label or on the FDA's webpage. They call it the uh, Table of Pharmacogenetic Associations. And that's what you're looking at now. This is the guideline. At the top, it's the FDA label for amphetamine. And at the bottom, it's that pharmacogenetic association table I was talking about. And so these guidelines, they're kind of scattered, right? Not only is this amphetamine telling me, oh, well, I may end up having higher levels of this amphetamine if my patient's a 2D6 poor metabolizer, it's saying that we don't know how profound that response may be, right? How profound that increase in exposure may be. And so rather than have you guys try and remember all of these guidelines or rather than have you guys like try and find all of these things scattered across the internet in various places, we decided to make your life a little bit easy. We created the GenMed Pro software it is a drug-drug, drug-gene interaction software that exists in your portal every time you test a patient. And when you enter a medication into this gene-drug, drug-drug interaction checker, it's going to take your patient's specific genetic profile. You guys can see it over here, right? This patient is a CYP2D6 poor metabolizer. And you'll notice that all those guidelines I just discussed, they're right here. And it's got a quick snapshot of the most important parts of the guideline, right? It's bolded. Now, this tool can also be used to find alternative medications that don't go through that 2D6 pathway. And it also links directly back to those primary sources because we want you guys to know that we're really trying to make this easy access. Uh, we're not trying to pull the wool over anybody's eyes. We're very transparent when it comes to all these guidelines and, and how important this information is. And so definitely feel free to click on those links, visit those sites, visit those guidelines. Uh, they'll take you to the primary source. Yep, you, I showed you with atomoxetine. You can see the same thing with those amphetamine-based products, right? This 2D6 polymorphisms can affect uh, amphetamine levels, and you will see that, that larger increase in AUC, or total drug exposure. Now, if you're looking at the report itself, let's say, well, I don't have time, right? I can't go using your internet checker, right? I can't sign into the portal every time I wanna look at a medication. Is this information available to me on the report? Well, yes, it is. It's going to be in the drug interaction summary, right? We're gonna give you a quick synopsis. And this sheet might look a little bit different to everybody here because this is the first time we're actually previewing this. Prior to, um, Prior to having this talk and um, performing some of the updates we're doing to our professional PGX test, we used to simply place a single arrow saying that this patient may have increased exposure to this particular drug. Many clinicians would ask us, well, how big is this increase in exposure? Is there any way you could quantify this for us? And so we did, right? We've stratified it by multiple risk levels. There's low, moderate, and high. You can obviously the see the moderate and the high risk here on the screen. And in general, uh, we kind of follow the FDA guidelines. 
generally uh, low risk is like a 25 to uh, 99 percent increase in exposure. Uh, moderate risk is generally about uh, 100 to like 400 percent. And above that, we're really looking at really strong inhibition, a really large increase in total drug exposure, right? That high risk icon with that atomoxetine there. That can be a very dangerous interaction. So we want to make sure you guys are aware of, well, which, uh, which drugs may only need a small dose adjustment and which may need a large dose adjustment or a dose adjustment right out of the gate, even at the very first starting dose. Moving on, other cytochrome P4 fat pathways outside of just cytochrome 2D6 that can affect your um, medications. Well, there's cytochrome 3A4, right? Not only do we test for mutations within 3A4, that might be able to tell us whether or not our guanfacine levels are going to be higher or lower. We've been shown with 3A4 inhibitors and 3A4 inducers that, well, there are also drugs that can increase or reduce those uh, guanfacine levels directly through that cytochrome 3A4 pathway. And so, and those changes, as you can see, are quite high, right? This is a threefold increase in total drug exposure with that strong 3A4 inhibitor ketoconazole. And so you can imagine that genetics may play a similar role in those slow metabolizers. They may see that, that rise in serum levels with the guanfacine as well. Now, what about the new kid on the block, right? Quilbury was just uh, approved for the treatment of ADHD. Um, it's an NRI, much like uh, Stratera, the atomoxetine. Um, it has some... Um, other things going on, <laughs> um, unlike atomoxetine, it's actually a pretty strong potent inhibitor of cytochrome 1A2. So we're gonna have to be careful with any drugs we give with the veloxazine. Um, more specifically, if you're curious what types of drugs are broken down by this 1A2 substrate, or this 1A2 enzyme, I'm sorry, <laughs> those will be drugs like duloxetine, mirtazapine, olanzapine, Right? These are all 1A2 substrates, including caffeine, and patients that are taking this Quilbury, this veloxazine, they may have much higher 1A2 substrate levels. And so we want you to be careful with those medications. Um, it's a much weaker 2D6 and 3A4 inhibitor. And so again, there, it's not gonna cause as many drug interactions in those two particular pathways. But as far as how veloxazine itself is metabolized, so now I'm moving away from how veloxazine affects other medications, and now I'm kind of moving into, um, you know, what might affect veloxazine. Well, 2D6 again, just like atomoxetine, just like the amphetamine I just got finished discussing, 2D6 plays a role in the metabolism of veloxazine. You can see in this study up here to the right that the combination of this medication with paroxetine, a strong 2D6 inhibitor, there was a significant increase in serum levels of veloxazine. It was small. And when they looked at this, um, they, they looked at patients with a 2D6 poor metabolism phenotype, they also saw a small but significant increase in those patients. And so while we do need to worry about this, these, these, this increase in serum levels was significant. Um, it's not going to be nearly to the extent uh, that, that same increase in drug exposure won't be nearly as large for veloxazine as it would be for something like that atomoxetine. So please be aware that yes, 2D6 is still gonna play a role in this new medication, but it won't be to the same extent that it does with that atomoxetine. Moving on, I think Dr. Patel really uh, managed this well. She talked about uh, those comorbidities in a couple different parts of her presentation. And she mentioned, well, anxiety about 33% of the patients with that ADHD had some comorbid anxiety. Do we also have genes that might tell us how our patients are going to respond to those anxiolytic medications? We do. And it's the same, it's those same institutions, the FDA, CPIC, DPWG, that are writing guidelines for these medications as well. So again, if you're curious, if you want to see those guidelines, but you want a nice brief synopsis of them, use that GenMed Pro software in your portal. It's going to take you right to these guidelines and it will tell you, right? Rapid metabolizers of citalopram and escitalopram, they'll ask you to consider using an alternative not metabolized by 2C19. 
They see much higher rates of inefficacy. And so they would prefer your patient try something maybe like a fluoxetine, right? That doesn't go through that 2C19 pathway. And so again, um, try to utilize that, um, that information to the best of your ability because there are many people with these genetic variations. You guys can see the frequency with how often these polymorphisms pop up. It's over here in the graphs to the right, right? If you're looking at, in particular, Caucasians, almost 30% of Caucasians are rapid metabolizers, right? Not so much in other ethnicities. And for, you know, poor metabolizers, you've got about 10 to 15% of these patients, right? For the 2C19, for 2D6, it's a little bit lower. It's generally around two to 7%. But just be aware that for any patient that does have these poor metabolism issues, they are going to be more likely to experience side effects on their anxiolytics. And so you may want to be cautious with the dosing of those medications. Now, moving on to the last section of our talk tonight is our case study, right? So today we're gonna to talk about TJ. TJ, he's an eight-year-old little guy with a history of ADHD combined type. Um, he presents to the clinic with his mom. Uh, they gave him Adderall XR, right? That was his first medication trial. It was titrated up to a pretty decent dose, right? 30 milligrams a day. And he was on it for about three months. But when TJ's mom came back, she basically said, look, he's not tolerating it really well. And it's not even working that great either, right? He's just, he's having trouble getting to sleep. He doesn't eat as much as he used to. And so we went ahead, you know, uh, we obviously, we set up a clinical consult to talk to the clinician, right? Even uh, TJ's mom was invited. And we decided, well, let's look at the genes. Let's see why maybe TJ didn't respond to his previous medication, but also what might end up being better for TJ in the future, right? And so that's what we discussed. First, we went over his cytochrome P450 profile because that's easy. Right? This profile just tells us whether the patient might have greater drug exposure or uh, less drug exposure. And what we found was looking at his cytochrome 2D6, he was in fact a poor metabolizer of this particular cytochrome. He would have elevated levels of amphetamine. And as you might expect, right, that may cause side effects like insomnia, right? It may decrease appetite. And so we recommended. Um, moving on from that particular medication class. You can see that there, right? I've kind of highlighted it in red. Now, uh, we also wanted to take a look at some of the alternative medications for treating his ADHD. And we also noticed that, well, cytochrome 2D6 is actually uh, increasing the drug exposure to veloxazine and atomoxetine as well. So, once again, uh, we didn't have to go to the FDA label. We have all that information readily available with the tools that we provide. Uh, but we do know that this increase in serum levels uh, may be a recipe for increased side effects. So we're gonna try and avoid those medications as well, right? You'll see that in some cases, patients will have a tenfold increase in atomoxetine levels, right? That's huge. <laughs> uh, five-fold higher peak concentration, which is your C-max, if you guys are aware of that. They've even showed quite the increase to overall half-life. So we wanted to really avoid that. Um, and we also wanted to right, concentrate on medications like clonidine, like guanfacine, that didn't seem to have that same level of genetic risk, right? We, did, we see very little genetic risk with those medications. So we went back We've, we've discussed all the pharmacokinetic issues that the patients have with the way they metabolize their with the way TJ metabolizes his medication. We also wanted to go back and look at some of those efficacy, uh, pharmacodynamic gene variants that Dr. Patel went over with you guys. And what we saw was, well, due to this COMP mutation, this alpha-2 adrenergic mutation, what we saw is overall a low, moderately lower odds of response for the amphetamine products and a lower odds of response for the methylphenidate products. There is some slight change to that verbiage. You might wonder, well, why does one say moderately lower? Why does the other say lower? Well, it's those meta-analyses that Dr. Patel showed you guys earlier, right? The comp enzyme, the patients were about 40% less likely to respond to their stimulants. 
Whereas with the ADRA 2A CC genotype, the patients were almost 70% less likely to respond. So again, we're not saying you can't give these medications. There's still a chance each of those medications can still be efficacious. It's just the probability. However, we do want you to be aware that, you know, we wouldn't be surprised if the patient was more likely to fail than, than the general population. And that's really the take home here. So instead of looking at those as options, right, we decided to look at something a little bit more clean. You'll notice that for the clonidine and the guanfacine, there really isn't anything here in column two affecting the side effect rate or efficacy of these two medications. And there's no, there are no arrows here in column four indicating an increase or a decrease in drug exposure. So knowing that these medications would have fewer genetic risk factors associated with it, we went ahead and decided to go with guanfacine. Um, TJ did have a follow-up appointment about a month later. Um, the mom was much happier with the response of the medication. He was tolerating it pretty well. Uh, obviously, anybody who takes these alpha-2 adrenergic agonists, he was a little tired, right, uh, receiving the initial bolus dose. But um, it got better throughout the day, and it seemed to be working a lot better uh, with a lot fewer side effects than that amphetamine. And so that's one way to utilize these test results. And again, if you guys want to go through an individual case study with us, if you've never used us before, or maybe you have and you haven't had a chance to have a consult, please feel free to call us. We will help you navigate the report. We will help interpret and tailor it specifically to your patient. That way you get a better understanding of how to, how to utilize these results. Um, now onto the Q&A, as Dr. Dowd said earlier, uh, everybody, please be aware that we cannot hear you. We cannot see you. We ask that you submit all of your questions through that Q&A function uh, down at the bottom of the screen. And so uh, we'll go ahead and take some questions now. Do you want to um, handle the moderation? Um, hey, yeah, Russ, I'll, I'll handle the moderation. In fact, uh, I'll, I'll be bold enough to try to answer this first question that we got about 15 minutes ago. So the question was related to the MTHFR gene and um, if there's any literature supporting methylfolate uh, supplementation or methylfolate use for the treatment of ADHD. Um, the short answer is this, not a lot. Um, as far as I know, there's only two studies looking at methylfolate for the treatment of ADHD. One was in adults, one was in children. Uh, the study in adults failed. So it was, it was methylfolate uh, added to, um, I think it was Concerta. Um, and there was no difference between augmenting with methylfolate and not augmenting with methylfolate. So for adults, there's probably very little return on investment there. Um, there's an older study in children, this goes back about 10 years ago, um, looking at methylfolate um, supplementation in um, children and adolescents and they used 0.2 milligram per kilogram of methylfolate in that study. And that did show an improvement to ADHD symptoms. One study, I think it was about 50 or 60 kids. Um, I haven't seen it replicated. Um, so, you know, uh, tread cautiously with methylfolate supplementation um, in regards to ADHD because there's, there's pretty little data there. Um, it tends to be very, very well tolerated. So the methylfolate studies in the context of depression, um, in, in almost every study, there was no difference between placebo and treatment group as far as side effect burden. So it's a very well tolerated drug and it works for the, to, to enhance um, antidepressant outcomes for depression and or anxiety. Um, it may work for ADHD, but we have very limited data to support that. Yeah. And to add to that, the only study I've seen with an actual association with ADHD was done in a small Turkish population, right? That CC genotype at the 1298 position of MTHFR was uh, associated with ADHD symptoms in general. But again, I have to reiterate what Dr. Dow just mentioned. These data are so preliminary. Uh, I wouldn't use it in any clinically meaningful way. Okay. Um... Russ or Seema, uh, question, is there any difference in inattentive versus combined type uh, in those COMPT or ADRA2A ADRA studies? 
Yeah, at least I can, um, we recently dug deep into the ADRA 2A studies. And I will say that um, a lot of that data was done with inattentive types. There were fewer done with combined types. Um, but even like the few that were done in combined types did show similar outcomes in terms of the uh, direction for the geoleals. Um, COMPT was also assessed in both inattentive and combined types. I don't recall, Russ, uh, Russ do you know if there were more studies done in one versus the other? Oh, unfortunately, I cannot recall that either. That's something we might have to get back to you guys on. <laughs> yeah, but, um, you know, Farm GKB has level of evidence for these different pharmacodynamic genes. And if you look at, if you type in methylphenidate and look at the COMP gene, um, you'll see that they, they, they call out both inattentive uh, symptoms and hyperactive symptoms. So they talk about this gene drug association in the context of both types. So we use the sim same language that they do. Thanks guys. Um, Russ, I think you're probably the best person to field this next question. Can you talk a little bit about how either THC or CBD or nicotine can, can impact the metabolism of other drugs? Of course. And so when, when we're talking about THC and nicotine, right, there's a big um, discussion we have to have surrounding route of administration. So nicotine and THC themselves are, they do not affect drug metabolism as far as inhibition or induction. However, when they are smoked, right, when we, when we produce what are called uh, aryl polycyclic hydrocarbons, right, um, or polycyclic aryl hydrocarbons, rather, um, these compounds can actually induce 1A2, cytochrome 1A2, and that can lead to rapid breakdown of drugs like saffris. Zyprexa, Cymbalta, Remeron, right, Luvox. And so, yes, those, those, not those specific drugs, nicotine and THC, but rather those, those byproducts of the combustion process can increase the metabolism of specific drugs. Now, cannabidiol actually is a pretty potent, uh, I think it's a moderate inhibitor of 2C19. So that particular drug will increase the levels, whether you smoke it or not, right? That drug can elevate the levels of drugs like Selexa, Lexapro, Zoloft, Effexor, right? Any of those 2C19 substrates. It's not going to affect many of the ADHD meds we've talked about today because not many of those drugs, in fact, actually none of them go through 2C19. So that shouldn't be as much of a problem when, when talking about ADHD medications, but certainly it can have quite the impact on those 2C19 substrates that we frequently see in the treatment of depression or anxiety. Yes. I, I, I'm jealous because sometimes I'm gonna download uh, Russell's knowledge of these medications into my own brain. So the best we did was um, create that GenMed Pro tool. So we basically um, uh, transferred Russ's brain into that tool. So if you forget what's a 2C19 and a 2D6 and a, and a PGP, uh, it's all in there uh, to make things a little easier. Um, thanks, Russ. I think I'll, I'll answer this question. Um, is there any evidence relating the DRD2 gene with ADHD or impulsive behavior? Um, short answer is no, I haven't seen any. There is data relating the DRD4 gene, so the dopamine 4 receptor, um, to increased risk for ADHD. I should stress that none of these pharmacogenes are meant to be used diagnostically. So we could never say, oh, you have DRD4, so you have ADHD, but there have been associations with DRD4 uh, and increased ADHD risk, not DRD2 as far as I know. Um, and then with impulsive behavior, that's more of a feature of COMPT-VAL-VAL. So these, Seema uh, uh, was talking about this earlier, COMPT-VAL-VAL, usually results in a deficiency of dopamine, that tends to be represented in impulsive type traits. Um, also the serotonin 1A gene, um, there's some evidence that uh, certain variants of serotonin 1A is associated with uh, impulsive predispositions. Okay. Um, so Russ, this is an interesting question. So you mentioned smoking. Um, you know, can you differentiate vaping from smoking? So let's use marijuana as an example. Is there a difference between, you know, marijuana edibles versus uh, vaping versus smoking and how it interacts with other 
uh, medications. Well, of course, right? So coming back to this, and I see uh, Deb's also asking a question about that, like uh, fireplace or campfire smoking as well. Mm -hmm. um, yes, basically anything, any kind of combustion product that generates these polycyclic aryl hydrocarbons can induce uh, this cytochrome 1A2 and cause increased breakdown of those 1A2 substrates. However, they have done, well, a couple of preliminary studies with vaping, and they haven't seen nearly as many of these uh, aryl hydrocarbons produced. And so to date, we actually don't think, uh, or at least with what small preliminary data we have as of right now, it doesn't appear that vaping induces uh, this to the same extent. Now, as far as campfires or char-grilled meats, here's what you guys have to understand. It needs to be a lot right? You need to eat like a pound of char-grilled meat every day. <laughs> we don't talk about it a lot because most people aren't doing this, right? You probably have to be camping, right? Like two to three times a week. <laughs> so again, we don't usually, we're not as worried about those types of things, but I think it is worthwhile to figure out how much coffee your patient's drinking. Because if you drink enough roasted coffee, like let's say three cups or more a day, that can also induce this enzyme as well. Right? That's also going to produce an increase in these polycyclic aryl hydrocarbons. So yes, there are going to be these aryl hydrocarbons produced in everything that we've talked about today. But some of those things, like the vaping and the campfire and the char-grilled meats, uh, generally you're not going to see that level of interaction with those carb hydrocarbons. Um, but for smoking, uh, for things like coffee, yeah, you're going to run into those situations a lot more in that real life scenario. So those are the things I would probably tell people to concentrate on for the most part. Was that clear? That was good, Russ. Thanks. Next. Seema, can you talk a little bit about um, uh, bipolar? Uh, you know, there's a high comorbidity rate between bipolar and ADHD. Can you talk a little bit how you handle medication management with someone who's bipolar and also ADHD? Yeah, absolutely. So typically best practice is to ensure that the mood is stabilized. So with you, whether that be with a mood stabilizer or atypical antipsychotic or a combination of the two before introducing a stimulant. The reason really for this is to mitigate the risk of exacerbating any symptoms. This also goes for anxiety disorders. Um, if we're kind of talking, if you're referring to the fact that antipsychotics block dopamine and stimulants enhance dopamine availability in the synaptic cleft and how that can balance each other out, you know, receptor affinity and these medications are far more complex than just simply um, kind of making that assumption. But I, what I will just say is that for best practice really comes down to stabilizing the mood um, before introducing something that could uh, worsen um, the symptoms of the bipolar disorder. Interesting enough, there was actually a study done with adjunctive listex amphetamine and bipolar depression. Um, so obviously there were be less of a concern um, with the use of these in like a bipolar two patient who um, has not had a manic episode. Um, but if we're looking at bipolar one patients, um, we wanna be really careful with these medications. I think there's some modafinil evidence for bipolar depression also, right, Sam? Yep, definitely. Armadafinil <laughs> specifically, right? Mm -hmm. Most of that placebo-controlled data was for armadafinil, yeah. Okay, I think we have time for maybe one or two more questions. Um, question here about how the sodium or calcium channels on the gene might play into the diagnosis of ADHD. Well, I'll go back to what I said before. None of these pharmacogenes are diagnostic. Um, you know, any single gene probably only has maybe a one, two, three percent influence on any um, diagnosis. Um, certain single genes can influence traits and predispositions, but we can never diagnose using any of these genes. With that being said, the calcium channel gene has been associated with, um, uh, with some poor working memory predispositions, uh, poor executive function predispositions but that's not the same as ADHD. No, in fact, the only data we do have for sustained intention impairment would be from the ANC3, right? Most of that data was collected in bipolar patients who of course are going to have more cognitive deficits in the first place. But the only there's only one study I can even think of where they showed that association. And that was uh, this uh, Roberto study, right? Back in, oh man, what was that? Like 2013 or something? 
And they did. They found that both in uh, the bipolar disorder patients and in their unaffected first degree relatives, the T allele was associated with reduced target sensitivity, right? They did have greater errors of commission. They did have impaired sustained attention. But again, look at these numbers. These are small. So even if this is a small risk for something like ADHD, uh, it's still not going to be used diagnostically in any way. But there may be some small risk associated with it. So yeah, I, I think Dan's uh, really hit the nail on the head here. I, I don't think we can use it in any way diagnostically, but there may be some uh, some impact, right, from these ion channel dysfunctions on cognition. We just don't, don't know to what extent. Um, clear? That was good. Thanks, Russ. A um, couple of logistical questions, and I, then I think we'll probably wrap up the presentation after that. So, um, you know, a, the most basic question, and it's a good, a good one, how do you get a Genomine test? Um, is it a blood test? Is it a saliva test? Um, it's a buccal swab. It's a cheek swab. So it's pretty non-invasive. Um, you can order a test from um, uh, genomine.com. You send, you give us your information. Someone will get in touch with you to get you a test. Um, we can mail, um, if you decide to order a test, we can mail a sample directly to the patient's house. They can do the swab. Um, mail it back to our lab, and then you as the provider will get the results back in about three days. So it is a report. Um, it's a very comprehensive report. It's 18 pages. Um, there is a bit of a learning curve um, to the report. So I would encourage um, doing a, a 30 minute consult with someone from this team when you get your first report. Um, the, the corollary to that question is how much, how much does this type of testing cost? Um, for most patients with commercial insurance uh, will pay $399 up front. Um, the good news is um, if, if, you have, uh, if you have Medicare patients, um, it's, uh, this type of testing is covered by Medicare for the vast majority of Medicare recipients. And in certain states, if you have Medicaid recipients, uh, this type of testing is covered in certain states, and, and you can reach out to, to us here at Genomind. We can let you know if your state is one of the uh, covered ones or not. So um, I think that answers all the questions, and we're right at 830 anyway. So uh, I'd like to thank everyone for their attention tonight. I'd like to thank uh, Dr. Romano and Dr. Patel for their uh, presentation. Um, you will all be receiving a follow-up email either tonight or tomorrow, we'll, which will include a link to this video, a link to the slides. It will also include um, a link to a survey um, for both of your presenters tonight. So this survey literally takes 30 seconds. So uh, we're always trying to improve these presentations. So please take, take 30 seconds out of your day to uh, rate your speakers tonight. Um, and we take that feedback seriously. So again, thanks everyone for your attention tonight. I hope you enjoyed this. If you have any questions, feel free to send an email to medicalaffairs at genomind.com. So for clinical questions, it's medicalaffairs at genomind.com. Anything logistical, you can just go to the Genomind website and um, someone from customer service can help you out there. So have a good night, everyone. Thank you.